Okay, so I think we are live now. Um, so hello everyone. I hope that everything is fine. We had some technical um, uh, issues today, but I think everything should be working. I'm very, very, very excited personally to introduce today's speaker. Um, before we go to that, let me remind that this is actually the last uh, uh, talk of the of the um, season. Let's say we have then go then in in a, a summer break. Um, so um, now uh, introduction uh, of today's speaker. Um, so uh, Gina Turigiano received a, a bachelor from Reed College um, some years ago. Uh, but uh, she did then her PhD at the University of California, um, where she of San Diego, where she received uh, her PhD in 1990. Um, so uh, actually, she did her postdoc with another giant uh, uh, in in, uh, in in the field uh, that is uh, uh, Eve Marta, uh, Abrande University, where she actually uh, then stayed. Uh, um, so she's currently um, uh, um, a professor at uh, the uh, Vision Science and Department of Biology at Brandeis. So um, actually, I think uh, Gina needs a very little introduction in terms of uh, her um, uh, field. Um, she is uh, um, working on homeostatic plasticity, intrinsic uh, ways for the neuron to adapt to uh, um, the activity. And she does that um, um, since a long time and in, in health and disorders. And that's what we are going to hear about today. Um, so Gina, your floor, your floor is yours. Uh, you can share your screen. Just a little note, um, I am not going to um, uh, be there for the Q&A uh, for some technical issues, uh, but Laura Concetta will moderate uh, Q&A. So please uh, uh, ask questions. And uh, um, again, our talks uh, are being recorded, uh, and uh, um, so you can um, watch that also afterwards in YouTube. So um, I'm very happy to have you here. So you can um, watch that also afterwards in YouTube. So can you share your screen? I, I'll go to, I need to. Great. So first, just thanks uh, so much for inviting me to do this. This is a real pleasure. It's kind of very interesting silver lining to the whole, um, you know, pandemic, which has been pretty awful in so many ways, but it is wonderful to have this kind of worldwide reach and let's hope some other good things come out of uh, some of these, uh, these bad times. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now and get this started. So I leave you alone there. Thank you very much. Great, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, and let's hope that this is going to work. OK, so I'm going to talk to you today um, about the role of uh, autism-associated shank 3 in homeostatic plasticity and circuit stability. And um, the work I'm going to tell you about today was really contributed to by you know, many, many people in the lab. Um, but in particular, the shank 3 story was really spearheaded by uh, Veda Kumar Tadavardi um, when he was in a postdoc in the lab. Um, and Chi Hong Wu, another postdoc, has contributed, as well as uh, Chelsea Groves Kunle, a, a grad student. And I'll mention a number of other people as we as we go along. So I want to start this talk out by um, delving into this idea of homeostatic plasticity and why we think it's really important for circuit stability. So the first half of the talk, I'm going to tell you a lot about this, and then the second half, I'll tell you about how Shank Three um, comes into the story. So I think some of the classic physiologists like Walter Cannon and Claude Bernard um, really uh, intuited this remarkable paradox at the heart of biological systems. And this, this paradox is that the component parts of these systems are turning over all the time. They're in constant flux. Think about uh, the protein composition of the synapse. All of those proteins are turning over all the time including the receptors. Um, the same is true of cellular components. The same is true of uh, connectivity in circuits, which is constantly in flux. Um, and yet, despite all of this remarkable turnover, um, there is this incredible stability to the system itself at the, at the level of the system. And so um, 
I think Claude Bernard, put, uh, sorry, Walter Cannon put this very, very uh, poetically, this notion that somehow um, this unstable stuff of which we are composed has learned the trick of maintaining stability. And um, the, the key concept in physiology that sort of underlies this paradox is this notion of homeostasis, that in order for these complicated systems to really work effectively, there have to be mechanisms that, um, that constrain these key physiological variables to maintain this system's level of stability. So how does this idea of um, you know, plasticity and stability um, apply to our thinking about neural circuit function and um, about how this function um, breaks down in some disease states? So there's many, many ways to think about this stability problem. I think it really permeates every aspect of brain function. Um, but one, I think, very uh, general way of thinking about it is sort of cartooned here in this uh, little uh, thought experiment. So imagine you have um, a many layered neural network. So each of these guys here is a neuron, it's connected to neurons in the next layer. Um, and you're trying to get the circuit to do just the very simplest thing it should ever have to do. And that's just to faithfully propagate some kind of time varying signal. So you're playing that into the input layer and you want it to propagate through the layers without um, either um, exploding or decaying. So this might sound pretty, pretty simple, but now imagine what happens if the gain of transmission from one level to the next is a little bit greater than one. And all that means is that this neuron drives the next layer a little more strongly than it was being driven itself. So just a small imbalance, you could say, in uh, the excitation inhibition ratio from layer to layer. So if the gain's a little more than one, well, the signal's gonna grow in strength. And um, if that imbalance um, persists, what will happen is that that signal will continue to grow. Um, and eventually every neuron in your network will be firing all of the time. And in that situation, you've really lost any information about the signal you're trying to propagate. So you might think that's not a problem. Um, just make sure the gain is less than one, but then you have the opposite problem you've basically built a kind of catatonic network. And this, the, the signal just decays instead of being propagated. So somehow the circuits in our brain manage to avoid falling into this hyper excitable state or this hypo excitable state. So you might think, mm, not so hard, just make sure you set up all of these connections to the right strength during development. But of course we know that these circuits are not static. So the strengths of connections between all of these elements are constantly in flux. And during experience-dependent postnatal development, um, which helps to refine these circuits and make them fully functional, or during um, learning uh, in other circuits, uh, the strength of these connections are being constantly tuned. And so what that means is that there needs really to be some dynamic way for these circuits to sense their activity and to homeostatically adjust excitability to keep some kind of stable function so that they can, for instance, faithfully propagate these signals. So one idea that we um, started thinking about um, many years ago now is that circuits could really solve this problem in a fairly simple way. If their individual components, the neurons, had a way of adjusting their own excitability. If, for instance, neurons could sense how many action potentials they'd fired in the preceding period of time and could adjust their excitability to keep that relatively constant. So we were imagining um, really a classic homeostatic mechanism that would act to constrain neuronal firing rates as sort of one major component of excitability. So um, in this talk today, I'm gonna to tell you two stories. And the first story has to do with this idea um, that neurons, individual neurons, have some kind of firing rate set point and that they homeostatically regulate firing around that set point. And in the second part of the talk, um, I'm going to visit this idea that maybe disruptions in these homeostatic mechanisms and disruptions in these set points could contribute to circuit dysfunction um, in autism spectrum disorders. Okay, so when we started um, 
investigating this idea many years ago now, um, we were using uh, an in vitro system. This was uh, cultures of neurons derived from primary visual cortex in, in rats. And we found um, this really interesting phenomenon, which is that we could manipulate the activity of these circuits. So basically, um, neurons would become, uh, these circuits would become active after a couple of days in culture. They would wire themselves up into these nice active circuits with synaptic inputs and spikes. And we could manipulate that firing. So for instance, we could um, raise firing by blocking a little inhibition in these cultures. And if we waited um, 24 or 48 hours, what we would find is that firing rates had actually regulated back despite the perturbations still being there very close to where they were before. And similarly, you could lower firing through a number of different uh, genetic manipulations, et cetera. And the same observation was made by you know, several labs now that um, perturbing activity in these networks um, would activate mechanisms that would bring firing back very close to where it was before. And so this is the idea that at the network level, these circuits have homeostatic mechanisms that restore firing. So what are the plasticity mechanisms that contribute? Um, well, there's been sort of a cottage industry in, in identifying these, and there's really a whole family of homeostatic mechanisms that contribute to this restoration of firing. Uh, one of them that we've studied a lot and that seems to be very important in visual cortical circuits is this process called synaptic scaling. And basically, if neuronal firing in these cultures is increased, um, what happens is that the strength of excitatory synapses um, across the dendritic tree gets scaled down in strength in a compensatory way. And that should act to decrease firing again. And conversely, if uh, firing drops too low, um, the strength of these synapses increased again in a um, sort of global way across the dendritic tree. Um, and that increase in strength would then act um, to restore firing. Now, it turns out that these homeostatic mechanisms like synaptic scaling are present not just in vitro. Um, you can also demonstrate that they exist in um, intact nervous system. And in particular, they've been studied a lot in primary sensory systems. So uh, an experiment we did again a number of years ago was to um, reduce sensory drive to primary visual cortex as a kind of analog to reducing firing in culture and um, to see if that would result in synaptic scaling up of synaptic strengths. So one thing I want to mention, and this becomes important throughout the talk, is that um, in rodents, you know, the eyes are on the side of their head and, and much of the um, visual world is only seen by one eye at a time. So this eye sees parts of the visual world that this eye does not see. And so this um, uh, visual drive is mapped onto the contralateral cortex to uh, a region of monocular visual cortex that only receives input from the contralateral eye. So this is very useful for us because we can block um, or reduce visual drive to one hemisphere of uh, visual cortex um, while the other hemisphere is unmanipulated. So this gives us a sort of within animal control that we've used extensively in the design of our experiments. So what we did in these experiments, and these, these are young animals during this classic visual system critical period. So this is uh, postnatal, you know, P23 uh, to postnatal D30. And this is a period of time when um, there was much experience dependent plasticity in visual cortex. If you lower visual drive um, to one hemisphere during this period of time, do this for uh, a couple of days and then sacrifice the animals, cut slices, um, and go in and do whole cell recordings from these neurons. So this is a way of taking a sort of snapshot of what we did to synaptic strengths through this visual deprivation. Um, what you see is this, if you compare the strength of excitatory glutamatergic synapses onto these layer four neurons um, in the control and the deprived hemisphere, you see they're bigger in the deprived hemisphere. This is a reversible process. If you just restore vision, um, they come back, uh, so they become equivalent again. 
And um, this process, again, seems to operate on the whole distribution of synaptic weight. So if you look at that distribution, you see that it's increased, it's shifted towards larger values across the whole distribution. And um, this sort of scaling up of the amplitude distribution of excitatory synapses is what uh, led us to call this form of plasticity synaptic scaling. So this really differs from classic Hebbian forms of plasticity in a number of important ways. One is that it doesn't appear to be uh, synapse specific, at least the sort of classic form of synaptic scaling really operates uh, on many um, of a neuron synapses at once. Um, it's also an MDA receptor independent and there's a number of other things that set it apart. Okay, so um, many, many labs now have been studying synaptic scaling intensively and trying to work out the, the signaling pathways that, um, that lead to this sort of bi-directional scaling up or down of synaptic strengths. And I would say at this point, we don't have a full description of um, all of the events that go into this uh, form of plasticity, but we know a fair amount. One thing we know is that, um, again, this classic form of plasticity seems to be uh, largely uh, induced through um, cell autonomous changes in firing. So neurons sense changes in their own firing um, through changes in calcium influx through a number of different calcium channels. That in turn um, modulates calcium dependent signaling pathways, including CAN K4 and CAN kinase kinases. Um, which lead to changes in transcription. Um, and that in turn leads to changes in um, the trafficking pathways that lead to the trafficking and accumulation of AMPA receptors at synapses. And so one thing I think this uh, diagram kind of illustrates is that uh, really um, many, many aspects of neuronal um, cell biology and physiology are, are modulated by um, these synaptic scaling protocols. They're really affecting um, many, many different uh, uh, trafficking um, processes that lead to these changes in synaptic strength. You could think of the uh, of synaptic scaling as really reconfiguring um, the um, protein uh, components at the synapse in a, in a pretty major way. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, synaptic scaling um, is uh, cell autonomous in the sense that neurons are really paying attention to changes in their own activity. Um, it's transcription dependent, and it's a sort of classic negative feedback mechanism that regulates synaptic amperoreceptor accumulation in the right direction to stabilize activity. So if firing drops, amperoreceptor accumulation increases and vice versa. So I told you at the beginning that in vitro, in these culture systems, um, it's pretty clear that you can manipulate the activity level in these circuits and they will self-regulate back pretty close to where they were before. Um, but one question um, that we really wanted to ask a couple of years ago is whether um, this operates at the level of individual neurons. So individual, do individual neurons regulate back to a sort of individual firing rate set point? And does this operate in vivo? So once we take these neurons and we connect them to um, real uh, cortical circuits and we connect visual cortex to the rest of the brain and we embed that in an animal that's running around in the real world, um, do neurons really, and circuits really behave as though there is some firing rate set point. So uh, a number of years ago, um, Keith Hengen, when he joined the lab, decided to tackle this question. And what we did was to um, implant uh, microelectrode arrays into both hemispheres of primary visual cortex. And uh, the reasoning behind this experiment was that if we wanted to ask whether firing rates in vivo come back to some kind of cell autonomous set point, well, we needed to be able to follow them over long periods of time while we were manipulating sensory drive to cortex. And we wanted to do it under conditions where the animals are really freely behaving, where we were just collecting every spike that a neuron fired, whether it was internally driven or sensory driven, um, from the point of view of these homeostatic mechanisms, it really shouldn't matter. 
So basically the, the design here was to implant uh, these electrode arrays into both hemispheres of, of monocular primary visual cortex um, and just have these animals sort of freely behaving in a, in a home arena. So they have a sibling for interactions, food and water ad libitum. Uh, they get a new toy every day, so it's a semi-enriched environment. And we were just gonna follow spikes over time and ask what happens when we do the same kind of visual deprivation experiment that I already showed you. So the protocol here is we're going to implant these electrodes, give the animals a couple days to, to recover. And then we're gonna record, and in this first experiment, we recorded uh, firing for eight hours a day for three days of baseline. And at this point, we um, closed an eye. So we just did this classic visual deprivation paradigm of suturing one eye closed. And what we thought might happen is that when we withdrew sensory input, um, that would induce a drop in firing. And if in fact, these circuits and neurons um, were homeostatically regulating firing, then over time, even if the eye remained closed, we ought to see firing come back. So this shows you um, an example um, ensemble recording um, from one of these experiments. So this shows you the recordings on the baseline day three, and we've got a bunch of different cells on this axis, and we're following them from, from many, many hours here. Um, and one thing you can see is that individual neurons have really, really different sort of characteristic firing rates. So they fluctuate, but each of them fluctuates around some very different um, baseline. After two days of deprivation, we found that activity across that, in whole, that whole ensemble had gotten much quieter. But by the sixth day of deprivation, activity uh, seems to be coming back. So what does this look like when we uh, look at this across um, a number of animals now? And instead of looking at mean rates, I'm gonna show you the distribution of firing rates for either the third day of baseline, the second day of monocular deprivation, or the sixth day of monocular deprivation with that eye still closed. So the mean firing rate is here, and here's a cumulative distribution, and that shows you the distribution uh, on baseline day three. One thing I want to point out is that even if you confine these recordings to neurons that are um, about 90% uh, pyramidal neurons, what you see is this very broad distribution of mean firing rates. So some neurons fire very slowly, and some neurons fire very quickly, even neurons of the same type. On the second day of binocular deprivation, what you see is that that whole distribution is shifted to the left. So firing rates have dropped across the distribution. But by the sixth day, what you see is that distribution looks really similar um, to what we saw uh, at baseline. <clears throat> and in fact, these distributions become uh, statistically indistinguishable from each other. So that's pretty interesting. That says um, activity comes back. And not only does it come back, but it seems um, that the, the distribution of firing rates comes back very close to where it was before deprivation. So there's really um, two possible explanations for this. One is that you know, there's some mechanism that sort of constrains that distribution of firing rates. But uh, the second and simpler explanation is that individual neurons might drop um, but when they come back, they come back very close um, to where they were before. In other words, they have a sort of individual set point that they return to. <clears throat> so to try to, to get at whether that is the case, um, what we needed to be able to do was follow the firing of neurons over, um, over many, many days. And this is pretty challenging um, because it means you need to maintain these stable recordings over essentially a nine day period of time. Um, so Keith spent a lot of time trying to optimize this approach. And in the end, we were able um, to do this so that we can follow a small number of neurons um, in any given animal, um, but for many, many days. So this is really optimized for um, uh, following the activity of individual neurons, not for obtaining activity from many, many neurons in the circuit simultaneously. Okay, so this is just to show you that we can do this. Um, so this shows you um, 
principal component analysis of the spike waveforms for two neurons isolated from the same electrode. And the color coding here shows you the spike, uh, spikes over time. And what you can see is that these two um, clusters of spikes remain really well isolated across this nine-day experiment. Um, this shows you the centroid of each spike cluster. Again, that stays really constant. And this shows you the spike waveforms, again, for those two units. If you um, scale them and overlay them, what you see is that the waveforms remain really constant over these nine days. So for a subset of these neurons, we can really follow them with very high confidence over many days. So what happens then um, when we do this monocular deprivation experiment? Well, the first thing I want to say, I want to show you, is what activity looks like over nine days under um, in the control hemisphere. So this is with no visual perturbation. So this shows you many, many days of recording, um, 12 hours light, 12 hours dark. And although there's a lot of fluctuations in the activity, I think um, what kind of pops out at you when you look at this plot is the remarkable degree of stability in firing rates over time. So again, neurons have um, mean firing rates that span many orders of magnitude. This is a log scale here, but any given neuron seems to fluctuate around um, uh, a very uh, similar sort of baseline rate. And not only that, but the order of neurons in the distribution remains really stable over time. So what this suggests is that these neurons do um, behave as though they have a kind of stable baseline firing rate, um, and they fluctuate around that in response to visual input and other sorts of uh, stimuli. What happens now when we perturb the activity by closing an eye? So here, um, this is now showing you uh, two example neurons um, that start out with very different baseline uh, firing rates. Here's where we start the monocular deprivation experiment. What you see is that induces a drop in firing um, in both of these neurons. Um, I just want to say that this reduction in firing is actually an active process that is induced through uh, long-term depression-like mechanisms. So it's really the close, it's blurred input through the closed eye that induces the drop in firing. It's not just the withdrawal of sensory input. So this takes a little bit of time. Um, but after activity has dropped, you see for each of these neurons, it comes back um, over time and it comes back pretty close uh, for each neuron to where it started. What about um, the entire population of neurons we're able to follow? Do they behave in the same way? So here's one way of showing uh, that, they, that they do. So now what we're doing is we're plotting the um, baseline firing rate of each neuron, so the firing rate here before we do anything, against the firing rate during early monocular deprivation. That's when, when activity is dropped. In the control hemisphere, neurons fall right along the uh, unity line each point here is a neuron. So that says that um, these neurons maintain pretty stable uh, mean rates um, during those two days of, of uh, controlled reporting in the control hemisphere. In the deprived hemisphere, though, what you see, and that's these purple dots, is that neurons fall um, mostly below the unity line. So most of the neurons experience this drop in firing. Okay, what about during late MD? So we did the same thing. We plotted baseline firing rate against late MD firing rate. Um, and now what you see is that for both the control and the deprived neurons, um, they fall back along that unity line. And those deprived neurons are really distributed along that line as though they've moved back up um, to their original point. Um, and this is a way of just quantifying how different their firing is at the end versus the uh, beginning of the experiment. And for these deprived neurons that's in purple, you see they come back really very close to their initial firing rate. So what forms of plasticity underlie this regulation of, um, of firing rates? One way we can ask that is to do exactly the kind of experiment I just told you about. We can do this monocular deprivation experiment, and then we can um, 
sacrifice the animals, cut slices, and do slice physiology at different periods of time to ask what sorts of synaptic and intrinsic changes have been induced um, that might correlate with this restoration of firing. And what we find is that both uh, synaptic scaling and um, another form of plasticity, intrinsic homeostatic plasticity, contribute to this restoration of firing. So if you look at uh, AMPA-mediated excitatory synapses, what you see is when firing has dropped, there's a um, depression in synaptic strength, and that depression um, is thought to contribute to this drop in firing. But if you then look over the subsequent several days, you see there's a potentiation in firing, and this seems to follow um, a number of the molecular and sort of phenotypic rules of synaptic scaling. But synaptic scaling isn't acting alone. It turns out that changes in intrinsic excitability are also contributing. So at least in these layer two, three parameter neurons where we looked at it, what you see is um, after six days of monocular deprivation, if you um, look at the firing rate of neurons in response to a brief current pulse under conditions where synaptic activity is blocked. So this probes really intrinsic excitability. What you see is that after monocular deprivation, neurons fire more spikes um, to the same current injection. So their intrinsic excitability has increased and their excitatory synaptic drive has also increased. And as a consequence, uh, firing rates come back uh, to where they were prior to this monocular deprivation. Now, for firing rate homeostasis to really function in a homeostatic way, this has to be a bidirectional process. Neurons have to be able to respond to perturbations um, in either direction. So that raised the question of whether um, firing rate homeostasis in vivo is really bidirectional. And this was a little tricky to get at because, um, you know, to probe uh, this recovery after a reduction in firing, we could use this classic um, monocular deprivation method that's been used since the time of Hugh and Wiesel. Um, but there wasn't a terribly good um, paradigm described for enhancing firing in vivo in the visual cortex. So um, Alejandro uh, Torado Pacheco, a graduate student in the lab, um, thought about this around with a lot of different paradigms and eventually came up with a pretty simple way of trying to perturb activity in the other direction. And the idea was just to um, reopen the eye. So first he did monocular deprivation, as I described before. So waited until uh, these circuits had re recovered firing with the eye closed. And at that point he opened the eye up again. And the reasoning was that at this point, restoring vision to this uh, intrinsically hyper-excitable circuit might drive um, firing in the other direction. And that turns out to be exactly what he saw. So here um, Alejandro is doing the same kind of experiment I showed you before. We're recording the activity, the firing rate of neurons in um, freely behaving animals um, in primary visual cortex. And you see the same pattern um, that we saw earlier in Keith's data set. So when an eye gets closed, firing rate drops, but then it comes back. At this point, when he reopened the eye, what he found is this um, potentiation in activity. And then activity seemed um, to be coming back over time. This experiment becomes pretty difficult. This is following the activity of individual neurons over 12 days now. So this is pretty heroic. Um, what Alejandro did next is just focus in on this period of time um, and ask what's going on in either the control or the reopened hemisphere. So in the control hemisphere, when you reopen the eye, um, nothing much has happened. There was no drop in activity to begin with. Reopening doesn't do much. Firing stays pretty stable. But in the reopened hemisphere, now what we can see pretty clearly is this potentiation of activity above control levels and then this slow restoration over time. Um, and this, uh, in a ladder plot, shows you the activity of individual neurons. So these lines connect um, individual neurons at um, baseline, at early eye reopening, and at late eye reopening. And what you can see is that most neurons undergo this potentiation, um, but then come back pretty close to where they were before. A few of them go rogue. Um, and this is another way of quantifying that. So this shows you the, the change um, from baseline um, in the reopened eye, there's this potentiation above baseline, 
Um, but then after uh, a couple of days measured here, you see that um, for most cells, firing has come back um, pretty close to baseline. So what this tells us is that pyramidal neurons in primary visual cortex regulate their activity around an individual firing rate set point. And this raises you know, a bunch of really fascinating questions. Um, for instance, how are these set points built? This is something we, we don't really know the answer to. Um, we have this kind of heuristic model in our head for how this works. Um, and the idea is that if you have firing rate of a neuron on this axis, as firing rates increase, that increases some signaling pathways, um, say a calcium dependent signaling pathway. Um, and this pathway has a negative sign. That means it's a negative um, scaling factor. It's gonna act to reduce excitability of the neuron. So if firing rip rises, it'll, this will push firing back in this direction. Um, and there are reciprocal pathways that are activated as firing rate drops. And these have the positive signs so of these act to push excitability and firing in this direction. And I think what you can see is that at some point, those two forces are gonna balance. And we're sort of imagining that the firing rate set point of a neuron might really emerge as the sort of stable point between these opposing forces that act to increase and decrease excitability. And if this idea is right, um, it gives you a pretty simple way of imagining how, in, how different neurons could have different set points. Um, because all you would really need to do to change the set point of a neuron is to change the coupling between firing rate and activation of one of these signaling pathways. So one of the things the lab is really interested in going forward is trying to understand how these set points are built. Um, but that's a story we'll leave for another time. And what I'm going to turn to instead today is this other idea um, that loss of these set points or possibly missetting of these set points could play a role in um, some disease states. Um, and in particular, you could imagine that any uh, disorder that is really characterized by perturbations in excitability, um, that disruption in these set points um, would be a kind of attractive possibility for how those disruptions are generated. So um, a number of years ago, we started thinking about this from the point of view of uh, autism spectrum disorders. And the reason that we started there um, is that there's a pretty well-described uh, literature suggesting that many, many brain areas um, in a number of different um, monogenic ASDs uh, seem to experience either hyper or so um, this is actually from a review from uh, Sasha Nilsson and Vera Villac from a couple of years ago. And what this does is um, just summarize uh, the prevalence of seizure disorders in a number of um, monogenic um, ASDs. And so you can see that many of them um, lead to seizures. The, the onset, the severity, prevalence, et cetera, really varies across um, all of these symptoms. But it seems to be a very prominent feature of many of these um, ASDs. And it also turns out um, that a number of um, these monogenic um, ASDs are associated in mouse models with disruptions in homeostatic plasticity, I should say mouse and uh, another group of models. Um, and so this is work from, uh, from many labs now, um, including some from work from our lab on MECB2. So this sort of raised the, the possibility that disruptions in homeostatic plasticity might be a very common uh, end of phenotype of ASDs. And that by compromising the ability of these affected circuits to compensate for perturbations, maybe um, these disruptions could really contribute to some of the either hyper or hypo excitability uh, phenotypes in some of these disorders. So to sort of dive into this a little more, um, uh, Vidikumar Tadavardi, um, when he was a postdoc in the lab, decided to 
look at um, Shank 3, another one of these uh, monogenic ASD-associated syndromes. So why Shank 3? Well, um, Shank 3 is a multi-domain um, synaptic scaffold protein. So here's Shank 3, um, much bigger than real size, uh, embedded in a postsynaptic density. But one of the uh, sort of salient things about, about Shank 3 is it interacts with lots and lots of other synaptic proteins, many of which have been associated um, with synaptic scaling. So for instance, the Gux um, or, uh, or Homer and links to metabotropic glutamate receptor signaling. So Shank 3 seemed to be well-placed um, to play a role in um, the sort of uh, signaling or trafficking events that underlie these changes in amper receptor accumulation during the synaptic scaling. And um, in, in humans, microdeletions and mutations in Shank 3 are associated with um, Philip McDermott syndrome, um, profound intellectual disability, um, autism, and um, a number of other neurological disorders, including, for instance, bipolar. Okay, so Shank. So Shank 3 is present at synapses. So um, this little icon up here is now to remind me to tell you that we are moving from this in vivo paradigm I've been telling you about uh, to uh, back to this culture paradigm. Um, and the idea here is that we can manipulate um, Shank 3 expression within individual neurons, just a few neurons per dish, so in a cell autonomous way, leaving all of the other synaptic partners um, unaffected. So we can really probe here for a cell autonomous role of Shank 3 in synaptic scaling. So one of the first things Veda did was to um, treat these cultures with tetrodotoxin, the sort of classic synaptic scaling paradigm, and then ask uh, what happens to um, Shank 3 synaptic levels. So this shows you some dendrites that have been labeled against surface uh, glue A2. That's a subunit of the AMP receptor, mediates excitatory glutamatergic transmission. Um, Shang-3 is present at many of these excitatory synapses. See, it co-localizes with glutamate receptors. And after uh, 24 hours of TTX treatment, you can see that Shank-3 accumulation at these synapses increases. Um, so we see uh, an increase in um, amper receptor accumulation. That is sort of one of the classic measures of synaptic scaling. There's also this increase in Shank 3. And this is actually bidirectional. I'm not showing you the data, but if we raise firing, we see um, Shank 3 levels go down. So Shank 3 seems to be um, recruited or removed from synapses in an activity dependent way. Is it um, necessary for synaptic scaling? So to get at this, uh, what Veda did was to do a sparse knockdown. So again, just a couple of neurons per dish of Shank 3. And he did this by introducing um, a short hairpin directed against Shank 3. So we're gonna transfect these cultures either with an empty vector, um, that's just gonna express GFP or GFP plus um, this hairpin, and then quantify the amount of Shank 3. And this allows us in individual neurons again, to reduce Shank 3 levels to about 50% um, of control levels. And this is, you could think of as being similar to uh, human haploinsufficiency of Shank 3. So Shank 3 um, in half the normal uh, amount um, produces these human syndromes. So what happens when we knock down Shank 3? Well, it turns out that we completely uh, block the ability of synapses to express synaptic scaling. So here I'm just showing you scaling up. Uh, the experiment is to uh, transfect neurons either with empty vector or with this short hairpin that knocks down shank. Under empty vector conditions, TTX increases synaptic strength. When we knock down shank three, that is completely blocked. So that's shown here. We can also rescue this by knocking down endogenous Shank-3 and replacing it with an RNAi insensitive version of Shank-3. And I'll just say, interestingly, um, for those of you who think a lot about Shank-3, overexpression of Shank-3 does not seem to interfere with synaptic scaling. So we need Shank-3 for synaptic scaling. What about intrinsic homeostatic plasticity? Well, somewhat to our surprise, it turns out that Shank-3 is also essential um, for this form of homeostatic plasticity. 
So again, if you infect neurons with the empty vector, TTX treatment increases um, this, their intrinsic excitability. They fire more spikes for the same amount of current. But when you knock down chain three, you block that increase in intrinsic excitability. And that's shown here. There's TTX. Um, this is the firing rate for different amplitudes of current injection. And when you knock down chain three, you prevent that uh, increased intrinsic excitability. So shank 3 seems to prevent both of these major forms of um, intrinsic, uh, of homeostatic plasticity. Um, and I'll get back to that again in a minute or two. So this raises the pretty fascinating question of how it is that shank 3 normally facilitates um, homeostatic plasticity. Why is it necessary? So um, we've been coming at this from a number of different directions, and we don't have a full answer yet. Um, but one very interesting thing emerged from um, a mass spec screen that we did, and also that was done um, independently uh, by Jeff Cottrell at the Broome Institute. And what we found is that um, synaptic scaling protocols in vitro, either treating with TTX or raising activity with uh, bicuculin or picotoxin, produces bidirectional changes in shank 3 phosphorylation. So shank 3 again, has many, many domains. Um, and it turns out, if you look at the, the sort of end of the protein, um, the SAM domain is important for synapse localization and dimerization. And this proline-rich domain is important for interactions with Homer uh, and also actin. Um, and what we found is uh, changes in phosphorylation um, at a number of sites, but most robustly bidirectional changes um, in two residues in this linker domain between these two, um, this linker region between these two domains. Um, the Broad raised a phospho-specific antibody against um, this site. And what you can see is that when you treat with TTX, there's a reduction in phosphorylation at this site. Um, whereas if you raise activity with picrotoxin, you see this increase um, in phosphorylation. So are these changes in shank 3 phosphorylation, these activity-dependent changes in phosphorylation, uh, critical for synaptic scaling? So to get at that, what um, uh, Chi Hong Wu and, and, and Veda did was to mutate um, these residues to make them either phosphomimetic or to make them um, phosphodeficient so they cannot be phosphorylated. And then we're going to use these mutants in our synaptic scaling assays. So this shows you um, the uh, phosphodeficient mutation. So the experiment here again is to transfect neurons at low efficiency with either wild type shank 3 or this um, phosphodeficient version. And um, it turns out that uh, this phosphodeficient version is completely unable to show normal scaling down. So here, when you treat with bicuculine, I'm not sure I showed you scaling down before, but this is the uh, other direction of regulation. It reduces excitatory synaptic strengths, and that's blocked by this phosphodeficient mutant. And conversely, if you transfect neurons now with this DD mutant, this phosphomimetic mutant, again, at low efficiency, what you see is normal synaptic scaling. You can see nicely with the wild type shank is blocked with this phosphodeficient mutant. So um, what these data tell us is that activity dependent shank 3 phosphorylation is critical for um, synaptic scaling. And we now really like to know what it is about phosphorylation that um, prevents or, or uh, sorry, that induces is necessary for scaling, does it, for instance, affect the interaction of, um, of shank 3 with other critical proteins in the postsynaptic density? Okay. I told you a few moments ago, a few minutes ago, that um, firing rate homeostasis in vivo relies on both synaptic and intrinsic homeostatic plasticity, this ability of neurons to stabilize their firing around an individual set point requires both of these forms of plasticity. And I also just told you that shank 3 loss prevents both of these forms of plasticity. So this raises the question of whether shank 3 loss um, 
interferes with this process of fire rate homeostasis in vivo. So to get at this question, we've returned to our in vivo model. So now what we're doing is again recording um, the firing rates of neurons chronically in, um, in vivo in these freely behaving, um, in this case, mice. So we're going to re record either from uh, wild type um, or littermate shank three knockout mice and ask what happens when we do this monocular deprivation paradigm. So it turns out baseline firing rates are not very different in wild type um, or shank three knockout litter mates. Um, and in wild type mice, when you close an eye, what you see is this drop in firing from baseline and then this restoration, very similar to what I showed you for, uh, for rats. This is still during the visual system critical period. But in knockout animals, you see that this, um, the drop in firing still happens, but the restoration of firing um, is either much, much slower or it really doesn't happen at all. Now, obtaining these chronic recordings from these really tiny um, critical period mice is tricky, so we decided to use a second paradigm to really probe whether this homeostatic restoration of activity is lost in vivo. And these are experiments that were done by Chelsea uh, Rose Kunle. We used another sort of classic paradigm. This is a monocular deprivation paradigm that induces um, shifts in ocular dominance. So now we're actually gonna look in the binocular region of primary visual cortex that receives input from both eyes that see this sort of shared part of visual space. Um, and normally there's a contralateral bias to the activity of neurons in V1. They're driven more strongly by the contralateral eye. And that's shown in the response magnitude. That's the ipsi eye and that's the contralateral eye. But after four days of monocular deprivation, what you see is that ocular dominance shifts and now the ipsilateral eye inputs grow stronger and the contralateral are depressed. This is known to be induced in part through heavy and LTD-like mechanisms, and this is induced in part um, through synaptic scaling and homeostatic mechanisms. So what do we see in, uh, in this ocular dominance paradigm? What I'm showing you here is the responsiveness of either the contralateral or the ipsilateral eye in wild-type animals um, in the non-deprived or after three or six days of monocular deprivation. And we see the sort of classic pattern that's been described, a drop uh, in responsiveness to the deprived eye and then some recovery. And then in the ipsilateral non-deprived eye, you see this increase in responsiveness. And what this means is that um, in the end, visual responsiveness from the two eyes um, is about the same as it was before, but the relative drive is different. However, in the knockout animal, you see this homeostatic phase of plasticity is completely missing. So this depressive phase still happens, um, contralateral eye responses depress and then really don't change, even if we wait longer, eight days of monocular deprivation. And in the um, ipsilateral non-deprived eye, you see this lack of uh, potentiation and responses. Okay, I'm running a little late here. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you um, one more sort of interesting thing that we, uh, we found um, in terms of the role of Shank-3 in homeostatic plasticity. So when, when Veda was busy working on um, mechanisms by which Shank-3 disrupts homeostatic plasticity, he came across this really interesting um, case report, which suggested that a human, two human Shank-3 patients who had been really unresponsive to a number of pharmacological treatments, um, turned out to respond to um, lithium therapy. And as you know, lithium um, has been used for um, a very long time, since the 50s, to treat um, a number of, uh, of disorders, including uh, bipolar disorder. It's still one of the frontline treatments for bipolar disorder. And um, there was a recent report um, from Lisa Montagio's lab suggesting that uh, lithium can uh, uh, augment um, amperoceptor trafficking and um, might uh, sort of intersect with homeostatic plasticity. So, so Veda got very 
excited when he saw this report and said, you know, came to me and was like, Gina, let's try this. You know, maybe this will rescue uh, homeostatic plasticity. And honestly, I thought he was, he was nuts, um, but uh, he didn't listen to me and he just went ahead and tried this. And so this is what he found. Um, and this, I should say, is pretty brief treatment with lithium. This is just 24 hours of treatment. And this is moving back to our culture system now. Um, what he found is, again, that um, knocking down shank 3 prevents TTX from uh, scaling up synaptic strengths. Um, however, when you treat these neurons first with lithium for 24 hours, what you see is that now TTX is able to induce uh, synaptic scaling um, just like normal. And lithium really does very little um, to synaptic scaling um, under control conditions when shank 3 is present, uh, nor does it affect baseline transmission. Perhaps even more surprisingly, lithium is also able to rescue intrinsic homeostatic plasticity. So um, what this shows you now is what happens when we treat uh, neurons with lithium first and then TTX, and you see this increase in excitability that looks very much like what we see um, when shank 3 is intact. So both of these forms of plasticity are rescued by lithium. And so this, of course, raises the question of whether lithium might be able to rescue um, some of the circuit defects that are present um, in shank 3 knockout animals. And we had wanted to try to rescue um, ocular dominance plasticity, but it turns out lithium is a complicated drug with lots and lots of targets, and it, it actually interferes um, with the initial phase of ocular dominance plasticity. So instead, what we did um, was turn to another sort of well-described behavioral um, deficit in these shank 3 knockout mice. And this is uh, that these mice excessively groom. And this has been described uh, in a number of different shank 3 knockout mouse models. So the first thing we did was try to replicate um, that grooming defect. So what we did was we took pairs of litter mates and they're uh, in their home cages um, and we just videotaped them uh, for a period of time surrounding um, lights on. So basically an hour and a half before and an hour and a half after lights on, quantified the amount of, of grooming. And what we saw is that indeed in these knockout mice, we could detect um, uh, much more grooming than usual. What we then did was treat both of these animals um, with lithium chow. So, so one week on lithium chow um, at a concentration designed to bring their uh, blood levels up to a therapeutic dose of lithium, which is high, it's about one millimolar. And then we quantified grooming again. So we did this in nine different pairs of knockout and wild type litter mates. Um, and what you see in the wild type is that um, grooming is really unaffected by um, giving them lithium chow. However, in the knockout animals, which start out grooming much more than their wild type counterparts, um, after a week on lithium, we see that grooming has come back. Um, it's been reduced and it's come uh, to levels that are very close uh, to what we see in wild type. And these experiments were done by Priya Kundinya um, with some help from uh, Hannah Ben David, a really um, talented undergraduate at the lab. So taking all of this together, um, what these data suggest is that in um, shank three, uh, in animals that are lacking shank three, um, that a lack of homeostatic plasticity really compromises the ability of these circuits, at least. In, in primary visual cortex uh, to recover from perturbations. And this, you know, in, in turn suggests that um, some of the circuit defects that accumulate over time in um, postnatal development in this shank 3 knockout condition potentially could really arise out of disruptions in homeostatic plasticity and also potentially could be rescued if we could rescue um, homeostatic plasticity in these animals, in these models. Okay, so um, I just wanna say many, many people have contributed to the story over uh, the years. I 
been really privileged to work with just a fantastic group of um, creative and brilliant people. Um, the work I talked to you about today um, was started um, uh, by Keith Hengen when he was a postdoc in the lab. He now has his own uh, lab at Wash U. Um, Veda uh, Kumar Tadabari really spearheaded this whole Shang 3 story, really talented. He's now off having adventures in, uh, in biotech. Um, Chelsea um, did those monocular deprivation um, uh, ocular dominance experiments. Um, and uh, Alejandro um, has been looking at bidirectional firing rate homeostasis. He has a talent for always missing uh, lab photo day. And I also want to mention Chi Hong, who's been picking up the Shang 3 story along with um, another grad student in the lab, Andrea Guerrero. And let me just mention many fantastic collaborators over the years could not have done this work without them um, and my, uh, my support. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and take questions. Okay, thank you so much, Gina. I'm the only one can, who can applause and I'm gonna do that. Thank you so much for your fantastic talk. So we do have questions. Let's start with the first one. So do you think that the firing threshold is an important variable for fixing the set point? What do you think is the relationship between firing rate, EI ratio, and threshold? Right. Um, so I think that the um, obviously the, the firing rate of a neuron is a complex feature that arises out of all of these things. So um, that's in a way why we wanted to go to this in vivo situation where we could really follow the firing of a neuron in a naturalistic setting when the animal is undergoing these fluctuations in light and dark and sleep and wake. And all of these factors are, are um, factoring in to the neuron's firing rate. And so what those in vivo experiments really say is that the mechanisms that stabilize firing are able to do that by taking all of these different mechanisms that are leading to you know, each spike and adjusting them to keep it constant. So the answer, so the question of exactly which um, of these uh, variables are being manipulated in vivo is complicated. Um, we know synaptic scaling is induced by some of these paradigms we know intrinsic uh, homeostatic plasticity and, and spike threshold is, um, is uh, uh, you know, adjusted. Um, we suspect there are changes in inhibition that's not been as well studied in these in vivo paradigms. So the answer is probably a lot of things are feeding into this many homeostatic mechanisms. I think it's a, it's a, um, uh, the, the firing rate set point is sort of a collaboration between all of these different features. Okay, That's thank you. Anyway. Okay, so here is another one. Is the activity regulated expression of shunk 3 calcium dependent and it's local and or transcription dependent? Right. Um, we do not know the answer to that. <laughs> Um, in fact, we don't actually know whether changes in the, in the synaptic localization of Shang-3 are really important in synaptic scaling. So we see these bidirectional movements of Shang-2 and from the synapse. Right now we're trying to ask whether the phosphorylation state of Shang-3 really influences um, its localization um, and interaction with other proteins, but we don't know whether the amount of the synapse actually matters or whether it's really who Shang-3 is interacting with. Um, at the synapse. And of course, the other thing that's fascinating about this is that, um, you know, we thought about synaptic scaling in Shang-3 because it's at the synapse, but it also has this dramatic uh, effect on intrinsic homeostatic plasticity, which presumably has nothing to do with this localization at the synapse. Um, so we don't really know what kind of um, pathways Shank 3 is really involved in for regulating intrinsic um, excitability. If it's the same pathways as for synaptic scaling or whether it's really different uh, distinct pathways. Okay, so another one. Are Shank 3 and AMPA accumulation in the synaptic scaling prep correlated 
or anti-correlated. Sorry, say that again, or shank three and... AMP accumulation in the synaptic scaling prep correlated or anti-correlated. Right, they're correlated. Um, so at, at, the at the bulk level, they both go up at synapses. Um, if you also look at the, so we did, we didn't publish this, but we did actually look at the um, correlation between increases in shank three and glutamate receptors and they, they're correlated. So they both seem to go up together. However, shank 3 isn't present at every excitatory synapse. Um, so that sort of raises an interesting um, wrinkle to that. And again, we don't really know whether it's the amount of shank 3 at the synapse um, that is driving synaptic scaling or whether synapses just get bigger, they've got more of everything, and so they have more shank 3 also. Mm -hmm. Whether those are causally related is not clear at the moment. Okay, so do you think that if you block the vision in early development, you will see the same effect? Right. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. It turns out that um, visual deprivation earlier than this classic uh, critical period also influences the function and you know of visual cortical circuits, and it affects excitatory and inhibitory synaptic strengths. But it doesn't differently. So um, the plasticity rules, excuse me, during the pre-critical period, as it's been called, this period right at between eye opening and the sort of opening of the classic visual system critical period, which was really defined by the ability of visual deprivation to cause shifts in ocular dominance plasticity. Um, those two phases seem to um, uh, engage really different forms of plasticity. So there does seem to be an important role of experience earlier visual experience earlier in development, but it's, it's, uh, it's distinct. The plasticity rules are distinct. Mm -hmm. Now we have another question from the same person. Are the results of shank three minus minus under lithium similar to the phospho mutant? Uh, Sorry, say that one more time. Are the results of uh, shank three KO neurons or animals under lithium similar to the phospho mutant? Mm. Right. Well, we haven't tried the phospho mutants yet in vivo, so we have to see what that does. That's on the on the list. Um, so you know, one question is, can we see the same? changes in phosphorylation of shank three with our monocular deprivation paradigms as we see in vitro with TTX and bicuculine. So um, that's, uh, that's one of the directions we're going in. So we don't know the answer yet, but uh, we will try to figure that out. Okay, now there's, ah, there's one that I also wanted to ask you. So the results that you showed apparently are an excitatory neurons, right? And yeah. in Okay, so what about inhibitory neurons? Right. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so where to start? <laughs> um, <laughs> all the in vivo experiments I showed you were looking at um, using the spike waveform to um, look preferentially at neurons that are regular spiking, and those are going to be mostly, not 100%, but mostly pyramidal neurons. We also do follow some interneurons that we can identify based on their um, spike waveform as fast spiking, um, presumably, you know, PV positive GABAergic neurons. We don't have a whole lot of those. So um, these experiments are, you know, we've, we've been slowly building up a data set um, and they don't seem to behave the same as the pyramidal neurons. So um, although they do also, their firing also drops and also comes back at, uh, at the level of um, the, av the ensemble average, the behavior of the individual neurons seems to be different. They, they seem to just kind of move around um, and don't seem to adhere to an individual set point in the same way. At least that's what our preliminary data suggest. I think we still need more neurons to be really 100% um, confident of that result. Thank you, very interesting. So do you think single neurons return to their 
previous rates, because the light suture is a fairly homogeneous perturbation, would you expect a different response to a more heterogeneous manipulation? Right, so first of all, the, um, the impact of lid suture on firing rates, that drop in firing is not homogeneous. So it turns out that some neurons um, drop a lot and some neurons only drop a little bit. Um, so that process seems to be driven largely through sort of Hebbian um, NMDA receptor dependent LTD like mechanisms. Um, and the amount of depression probably depends a lot upon um, the input that neuron is receiving. So, um, so different neurons drop to different extents. Um, yet each of them then seems to come back very close to its initial firing rate. So that homeostatic response is very uniform. So that's about the best I can, you know, evidence I have right now that the, that, you know, neurons uh, are really, um, that non-uniform manipulations would, would trigger the same kind of homeostatic response. Um, but, uh, you know, at the moment, we have mostly used these kinds of um, sledgehammer approaches, you know. Um, we are actually starting to play around with other ways of manipulating activity of neurons in V1 that are much more naturalistic. Um, and that's something that uh, I think is going to be pretty exciting and will help us get at some of those really interesting questions, you know, how how does homeostasis actually interact with circuits that are undergoing, you know, a real learning process? Okay, so I do have a, I guess the last question, I asked them all. So, um, do you know what sets the, the, the firing point, like expression of potassium channels or sodium channels or whatever it is? Right. So uh, this is something uh, that uh, Nick Trojanowski, a postdoc in the lab, is, is working very hard on. Um, and it's a difficult question to answer. Um, so he actually has a bioarchive preprint that you could go look at if you're really interested in this. Um, we've been taking is to, and we don't have an answer yet, but the approach we're taking is to, um, to actually label neurons in vivo by their activity set point and then look at them in vitro and actually ask what's different about them. And so um, one interesting thing that's quite different about them is their intrinsic excitability. And so that really suggests there's going to be major differences in um, ion channel composition between high and low firing rate neurons. So this is really, uh, you can think of it as a, um, it's something that's sort of orthogonal to the way we normally think about cell type right? Because Nick can look at the same cell type and he can find neurons that fire at high rates or at low rates. And you can see these differences in expression um, of, uh, well, differences in intrinsic excitability that we presume are correlated with differences in channel expression. So I think that's going to be, you know, a fascinating question. My guess is different, you know, different cell types will use different ways of, of differentiating their set points. Um, and of course, that doesn't really answer the question of how they end up with different set points to begin with, um, which is where I think it gets really fun. Thank you. So we have um, one last question. How is lithium compensating for the loss of shank? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> so um, initially we thought maybe what lithium was doing was increasing the amount of uh, the remaining shank three, and there's some evidence from the literature that it can do this. However, we still see um, this rescue of synaptic scaling in by lithium in knockout neurons. So it really does not rely upon remaining shank three. It seems to be operating downstream of shank three. We know that um, uh, so lithium is known. Um, to uh, uh, modulate the GSK3 pathway. And we can also replicate the effects of lithium by using GSK3 inhibitors. So that's one clue um, that it may be manipulating uh, that pathway. Um, 
downstream of Shank 3, but exactly, you know, all the pathways by which Shank 3 regulates scaling and where lithium comes into that to modulate it is, um, is something we, we want to know. Okay, so that was the last question. And I just want to thank you again for a wonderful talk. And I guess that Gaia wrote on the chat that the next appointment will be in September. So happy vacation to everybody. Okay, thank you again. Bye. That was a lot of fun. Bye, 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 thank you. Bye-bye.